Bannon's missing. Is everybody down here? Yeah, no. Let me know when he's can't wait you can come home and let everyone know that you're okay. We love you. The search for 11-year-old Gannon Stock intensified today, but there's still no sign of the missing boy who's been gone now for 10 days. Day 12 of the search for Gannon Stock. And he's going to come home to his friends and he's going to come home to his family. Three weeks since an 11-year-old boy vanished in Colorado Springs, and there is still no sign of Gannon Stout. Investigators say the 11-year-old is dead, and this is now a murder investigation. Right now, Gannon's stepmother is in custody. Well, we've yet to locate Gannon this morning, just after 8 o'clock a.m. East Coast time. Letitia Stout was taken into custody in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, without incident by law enforcement officers from this, the El Paso County Sheriff's Office. <laughs> Why, Tisha? <laughs> doing all the work for my stepkids and their mom doesn't help. I don't like my stepson. You'll never know when it's too late. How long does a body start to decompose in a bag? Google searches have become a big part of our way of life. Enter any question or thought that comes to mind into the search bar and instantly get the answer. We trust it so much, we believe it over our own knowledge. We know how to ask it questions in a conversational way, using everyday language, as if we're talking to another person, a friend with whom we entrust our most private thoughts about our health, our finances, our relationships, our plans, frustrations, and even our darkest secrets. When in truth, every article you read, video you watch, and question you enter into the search bar is building a digital footprint somewhere on a server in a cloud for a stranger to access. And the data collection reveals a lot more than just your clicking habits. You may be surprised to know that it reveals information about your state of mind, exposing your motives, desires, and deepest thoughts, even those you may wish to keep hidden. While this might sound trivial to you now, you should know that that footprint is increasingly catching people by surprise. All of your searches, when looked at together, is a window into your consciousness, exposing what you are doing, buying, thinking, feeling, and planning around life events. And it's not just the content of your searches that is revealing, but also the timing and frequency of them. The number of times you search and iterate on a topic can end up making you look obsessed to someone on the outside looking in. It's a scary thought, but when someone commits a heinous crime such as murder, you might also find it comforting to know that Google can provide investigators a glimpse into their state of mind before, during, and after the crime, revealing the consciousness of the killer. And while the killer may try to hide their thoughts and intentions from the people around them, when discovered, their search history often exposes clues about their motivations. This was the case in the tragic murder of Gannon Stauk, an 11-year-old boy who on January 27, 2020, was reported missing from his Colorado Springs home and later determined to have been murdered by his stepmother, Letitia Stauk, 
who stuffed his body inside of a suitcase and tossed it over a bridge 1,400 miles away from where he was last seen. We're going to get into it, but first be sure to hit the like button, subscribe to the channel, and hit the notification bell so you don't miss out on updates to this story, trending topics, and so much more. Now let's get into it. Gannon Stauk is described by his mother Landon Hoyt as a quiet, smart, loving, and energetic child. He loved playing video games, watching YouTube videos, and playing sports, especially soccer and basketball. His mother also said that he was a responsible and independent child who loved spending time with his family. Gannon's father, Al Stauk, describes his son, who was born on September 29, 2008, weighing less than two pounds, as a fighter. At birth, Gannon was given a 10% chance at survival, but to their surprise, he would overcome the odds and grow into an 11-year-old loving boy who wanted to be a YouTuber. Hey guys, and today I'm, I'm about to play some Sonic Mania. Gannon loved Sonic. Blue was his favorite color. He also had ADHD and took medications that caused him to suffer from chronic digestive issues that sometimes led to him having accidents in his pants. According to his father, Gannon would sometimes get a little down when the accidents occurred. Al was first married to Gannon's mom, Landon, with whom he had his son Gannon and daughter Lena. Later, they divorced, but would continue to share custody of their children. In January 2015, Al would marry his second wife, Letitia Hardin, who he had met while going through his divorce from Landon. Letitia was beautiful, educated, athletic, enjoyed hiking, and she worked as a school teacher, which takes a special kind of person, someone with patience, empathy, flexibility, passion, dedication, and most of all, someone who loves kids. Who wouldn't want those qualities in a partner? It's no wonder Al fell in love with her. He described Letitia as loving and fun to be around during the early times of their relationship. They were both single parents and Letitia appeared to be a wonderful mother to her daughter. Together, Al and Letitia would blend their families, Letitia contributing one biological daughter, Harley, 17, and Al contributing two biological children, Gannon, 5, and Lena, 2. Al is a military man. As a member of the U.S. National Guard, Al's military lifestyle would involve frequent relocations and deployments, often leading him to working and residing in various parts of the country. This aspect of military life on its own can be challenging for any marriage, especially a new one. Around February 2017, after a couple of years into the marriage, Al would file for full custody of his children. He wanted his kids to reside with him full time so he could fully embrace the responsibility and the joy of their constant presence. When small kids are involved, the wife of a military man would be expected to manage the day-to-day -day needs of their children without the help of their partner for extended periods of time. She would be expected to juggle household responsibilities, maintain a routine for the children, and manage their emotional well-being, all while coping with her own stress and anxiety. It's a tough role. Although Letitia was a mother herself, having experienced the challenges that came with raising small children, it didn't appear she was ready to take on the responsibilities of caring for her new husband's kids full-time. Before the kids came to live with them on a full-time basis, Al would sometimes notice the excitement that Letitia and Harley exhibited whenever the kids would leave after a visit. He would catch glimpses of them doing a happy dance, celebrating their freedom from the responsibilities that came with being a blended family. It was as though a weight had been lifted off of their shoulders and they were finally free again to do as they pleased. Despite his concerns, Al took full custody of Gannon and Lena in 2017. Then later that year, he would be assigned to work in Alaska, which required him to relocate from their home in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, to take on the assignment. And because of this, Letitia would subsequently find herself stuck in a primary role, raising the two young children of her new husband. 
She was not happy, nor did she support Al's decision to work in Alaska. Upon finding out the news, Letitia became so angry she threw Al's clothes out onto the lawn and refused to speak with him for nine days. After some time transpired, it would appear that Letitia was finally coming around to the idea of Al working in Alaska. She and the kids would begin making routine trips to visit him, but she had no plans of living there long term. And Letitia made it very clear she hated Alaska, telling Al that the U.S. should give it back to Russia. As time went on, Al would notice a change in Letitia's behavior. The fun and loving nature that he once admired started to dissolve, leaving behind a very different person, someone with a dark side he had never seen before. Over the course of a few months, Al started noticing that Letitia had been routinely using manipulative tactics to get what she wanted. He frequently found himself playing detective to get to the truth. 20, there was other instances in our relationship where something would happen of a much lesser degree, obviously, where, you know, maybe a hundred dollars goes missing. Or at one point there was, she took some money out of the bank account and then there was a story fabricated. So I, I kind of had to play Sherlock Holmes in a couple other instances with her. Um, and, and so I, she kind of trained me for it. So I, I had that experience with her directly obviously much less significant, as I already said. Keeping Letitia happy became quite challenging because she would often make excessive demands for his personal attention, and she would grow noticeably resentful each time he went away for work. After realizing that Al had no intention of returning home from Alaska, Letitia became determined to change his mind and would soon begin devising a scheme to persuade him to come home. Instead of her choosing to simply confront the issue with Al directly, Letitia would opt for another path, a more perverse one. She would choose to go the route of making his work environment so unbearable that he would ultimately be forced to seek a transfer. In 2018, Letitia made seemingly false harassment accusations against two of Al's commanding officers, and she would further lie to Al by fabricating a story about her being pregnant with twins. Was there a time when she specifically sent you a text uh, and told you that she was pregnant? Yes. And did that text also include a um, ultrasound picture? Yes. Did she tell you that she was actually pregnant with twins? Yes, sir. Did the defendant ever give birth to twins? No, sir. Well, did you ever go to any um, doctor's appointments with the defendant? For that specific instance, no. Okay. Um, do you know whether she went to any doctor's appointments for those, that specific incident? I'm confident that she did it, no, sir. According to Al, it was these manipulative behaviors that would ultimately lead to his transfer to Colorado in 2019. And it was early that year when the entire family, including the three children, began living together on a full-time basis. This living arrangement would become a significant change for everyone involved, as they had previously only lived together part-time. Letitia, Harley, Gannon, and Lena would make the move from South Carolina to Colorado Springs in early January. Al would arrive on February 15th to join the family in their new home in the Lorson Ranch neighborhood. Letitia finally had her dream of living together as a family under one roof but things didn't turn out to be as easy as she anticipated. Life was far from ideal as everyone was learning to adjust to their new family dynamic. Harley said there were lots of arguments during their time together. And following many of the arguments, she and her mom would pack up and leave Colorado only to return shortly thereafter. January, 2020. The newly blended family was on the brink of celebrating their one-year milestone and should have been eagerly awaiting the arrival of their fourth season together. What was meant to be a joyous occasion, commemorating the progress they had made and the bonds they had forged, would end up giving way to serious cracks in the family's foundation. In early January 2020, Al and Letitia celebrated their fifth wedding anniversary on a weekend cruise and would return home to be visited by Al's mother. 
During her visit, Al would unfortunately be saddled with work obligations that required him to work full days on both Friday and Saturday. And as a result, Letitia would be left not only to care for the children, but also to entertain Al's mother during those days. When Al would leave for work, which could sometimes be for months at a time, his kids would regularly be left in the care of his new wife, Letitia. But during each time, Letitia would complain that their biological mother did nothing to help out while she would be left to do everything on her own. Letitia had been left with the kids and Al's mother all day Friday. It's now Saturday afternoon and it's more of the same. She knows that in just a few hours, Al would be leaving for yet another two weeks. Saturday, January 25th, 2020, 1.51 p.m. I wonder if my husband's ex-wife is sending me a Valentine's card since I raised her kids. The responsibility of taking care of Al's kids weighed heavily on Letitia, so much so that it amplified her doubts about staying in the relationship. She felt unappreciated and used. She would struggle to find her place in the family, and to make matters worse, she harbored a strong dislike for her stepson, Gannon. I don't like my stepson. I don't like my stepson. Should I get a divorce? One might assume that Letitia, having been a mother herself, would have understood the challenges that come with marrying a man with small children and been up for the task. With her previous experience as a single mother, one might have thought she possessed the qualities required for effective parenting, but the reality was quite different. Signs of Letitia's resentment and desire to leave were brewing under the curls of her smile during Al's mom's visit. She wanted to escape her life and move to Florida, but she also wanted to dig up dirt on Landon too. U-Haul truck rates Colorado Springs, Colorado to Orlando, Florida on February 6, 2020. Landon Marie Hoyt. U-Haul truck rental. U-Haul truck rates Colorado Springs, Colorado to Orlando, Florida on January 22nd, 2020. As evidenced by her search for U-Haul rates for the following day, Letitia was contemplating a drastic decision. The thought of simply walking away and leaving everything behind has started to take hold in her mind. The weight of her unfulfilled desires and the persistent feeling of being unappreciated had pushed her to a breaking point. Sometimes you just leave and take nothing. Al would soon be leaving for a two-week training that Saturday night, and Letitia's anger was triggered because of it. That afternoon, Letitia's anger would reach a boiling point. Her Google searches would also become a serious red flag. Military dating and singles at militarycupid.com. Parenting should be for people, not just one. She was over it. I am over doing all the work for my stepkids and their mom doesn't help. My husband's ex-wife does nothing for her kids. Letitia didn't feel like a wife. She felt more like the help. It seemed that her role in the relationship had gradually shifted from a loving partner to someone whose sole purpose was to cater to her husband's needs. I feel like I'm just a nanny, not a stepmom. Husband uses me to babysit his kids. Sent husband some sexual messages and he ignores them. Letitia found herself trapped in a web of emotions as not only did she feel used, but she also grappled with a deep sense of rejection from Al. The weight of these feelings only served to further her anger. January 25th, 2020. It's 1.54 p.m. and the tension had reached its breaking point as Letitia's fingers hovered over the keyboard to construct a message that would send shivers down the spine of anyone who stumbled upon it. Her words would paint a chilling warning of her intentions. One day, some people will wish they treated you differently.
as the ominous warning took shape on the screen of her phone, Letitia's diabolical plan for what was to come would also begin to unfurl. After working that Saturday night, Al would have just enough time to eat dinner with the family before he and his mother would have to leave for the airport. Al's mom was scheduled to leave that Saturday evening, and since Al had an early morning flight out to Oklahoma the next morning, he decided it would be most convenient just to camp out in the airport that night. Letitia's anger simmered beneath the surface as she watched Al walk out the door, leaving her alone with the kids and in a whirlwind of emotions. The intensity of her anger was palpable, and it manifested itself in the frequency of her searches, painting a clear picture of her state of mind. Letitia's web searches would pick up sometime after dinner around 7.57 p.m. She not only wants to trade Al in for another guy, this time she wants a rich guy, someone who will pay her to take care of his kids. Find me a rich guy who wants me to take care of his kids. Find me a guy who wants me to take care of his kids and get paid. She's also making plans to move. One bed, one bath, apartments for rent in Fort Lauderdale. South Florida jobs, teacher. Orlando jobs, Disney. Orlando jobs, cruise port. Shortly after Al left for the airport, Letitia, now home alone with the kids, would say that she and Gannon were taking out the trash and cleaning out the garage when Gannon stepped on something and injured his foot. Letitia would also say it wasn't anything serious, but it did bleed, so she put a Band-Aid on it, and he was fine. Sunday, January 26, 2020. It was a partly cloudy Sunday afternoon when Letitia, Lena, and Gannon would decide to go for a hike at Garden of the Gods, a beautiful public park in Colorado Springs. Harley didn't go because she was asked to work that day to cover for someone who had called in sick. Letitia would also clarify that Gannon's foot injury was minor, so they were still able to go on the hike. While they were there, Letitia took a selfie of herself, Gannon, and Lena at the park. About 10 minutes later, Letitia sends Al a text message saying that they had to leave the park because Gannon had had an accident in his pants. About 50 minutes after that, a neighbor's surveillance camera would show Letitia, Gannon, and Lena returning home in Letitia's black Volkswagen Tiguan. After the passage of several hours, the evening would settle upon Letitia and the children, and Al would receive another text message from Letitia. In it, Letitia would claim that Gannon lit a candle because he could still smell his accident from earlier. She would also later say that Gannon knocked the candle over, broke the glass, burned the carpet himself and the couch where he was lying down in the basement of the house. The fire alarm rang out. There was smoke, so she gathered Lena and the dogs, ran out of the house, jumped into Al's truck, realized that Gannon wasn't there, so Letitia would go back inside to get him. She went down into the basement where Gannon lay partially asleep with fire on the carpet and the blankets that covered him. Him. She pulled Gannon with the covers down onto the fire, jumped on him, put the fire out, and when she was done, there was blood and burns on both her and Gannon. The two ran up the stairs and out of the house through the garage. Gannon was behind her, but he would trip on the way. Gannon would then get into the front passenger seat of the truck. Lena was in the back seat with the dogs, and according to Letitia, they drove around the block because the smoke was so bad. Letitia said that when they returned home, Gannon and ran into the street, screaming, I hate my life. Letitia also said that Gannon slept in Lena's bed that night, that he had the shivers, so she piled more blankets on him. Depending on when and to whom Letitia would tell this story, Gannon would go from being asleep to awake and from having burns on both of his arms to burns and blood from the fire and broken glass. Letitia said she didn't notice that he had blisters on both of his arms from the burns until later, but that they weren't serious. Gannon, however, was freaked out about it. Well, devastating. Initially, Scott, I can't lie when the TMZ information. Gannon, I promise this is the last time I'm going to ask you. I'm just freaked out, okay? Are you sure you didn't do it on purpose? <laughs> Okay, you promise. You promise. Perfect. Pinky promise. Thank you. Okay, all right. So listen, 
listen, we're, all right, I'm, we're going to have to sell stuff to fix it. Okay. So we figure out what we got to sell. We can sell the sofa. We can sell whatever, because we got to get it fixed. So lady, don't be mad at us and kick aside the house. Okay. You got it. Letitia would later claim she accidentally recorded this video Sunday night just after the fire. Here she is heard making Gannon swear he didn't start the fire on purpose, and then she strangely gaslit him into thinking that they would be evicted from the house unless they sold the couch and other items to fix the carpet. Letitia would also post this video to Facebook because she felt it would exonerate her in some way. But as it would later be discovered, this video that Letitia published online was merely a clip a shorter version of the full video that she recorded that night. She published only part of the full video. Why would she do this? If we carefully listen to this shorter version, we can glean from it that Gannon was in fear and was very emotional. More importantly, Gannon appears contrite for knocking over the candle. He doesn't deny knocking it over, but he doesn't admit to doing it either. Making him pinky promise that he didn't do it on purpose makes the listener assume that Gannon was guilty of knocking the candle over. What Letitia was doing here is much more nefarious than what appears on the surface. Since the beginning of the case, Letitia was obsessively concerned about what people were saying about her on social media. She joined a lot of Facebook sleuth groups to keep tabs on what they were saying about her. She often replied in those groups to combat the allegations, sometimes disguising herself as Harley or someone else. In Letitia's mind, this portion of the video that she released, as creepy as it may be, exonerated her from suspicions that she intentionally set the fire to harm Gannon, as these were the accusations being levied against her at that time. Now, let's listen to the full version of the video that the authorities were able to obtain from the seizure of her phone. Two, I just don't know what to do. Well, devastating. Initially, Scott, I can't lie when... The TMZ information. Gannon, I promise this is the last time I'm going to ask you. I'm just freaked out, okay? Are you sure you didn't do it on purpose? Okay, you promise. You promise. Perfect. Pinky promise. Thank you. Okay, all right. So, listen. Listen. We're, all right, I'm, we're going to have to sell stuff to fix it, okay? okay. So, we figure out what we got to sell. We can sell the sofa. We can sell whatever. Because we got to get it fixed, so lady, don't be mad at us and kick aside the house. Okay? You got it? You got it? I'm just worried about my. Friend. Okay, shh. Listen, 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 listen. So tomorrow. The remaining portion of this video is really important here. Why? because it reveals something no one except Al and the police knew at that time. In this version, she talks over him while he is saying something, something she didn't want revealed, that he was burned. Social media would have been set ablaze had this information been made public. They were already suspicious of Letitia. This was a social media campaign by Letitia to prove her innocence. Gannon was the first to reveal he was injured, and he did it in the full version of this video when he said, I'm worried about my burns. Letitia did not want this information revealed because it was proof of her harming him. Folks online were already suspicious of her. They were accusing her of intentionally setting the fire, and they were suspicious that she was intentionally harming Gannon. The night of the fire, in her messages to Al and Harley, regarding the candle spill. Letitia never said anything about Gannon being injured. Instead, she said that she was burned on her arms. 11.30 p.m., what is that? Um, so it takes Harley approximately 20 minutes to get home. Harley's now home when this message uh, from the defendant goes to Mr. Stout. Um, it's 11.30 p.m., Sunday night, and it reads, Gannon was on the toilet most of the night upstairs and downstairs. He had a candle on earlier tonight because he said he kept smelling poop from his accidents in his pants. 
That's what he told us afterwards. And he went for his headphones and dropped it, catching the covers and couch, small spot, on fire. I got Lena and dogs outside when we heard fire alarm. But once I got down there to get him, I had to throw another cover on it. It was minimal. No need to call for help or anything because nothing too bad. He is upset and wrote on a notebook he was sorry. I didn't want, he didn't want me to tell you because he was scared and freaking out about getting in trouble and being grounded. It's stuff we can fix and everyone is okay. I burnt my arm a little, but it's all good. He was more scared and embarrassed. That's true. And then uh, Mr. Stout did not respond at this time. No one knew Gannon was burned until the day the police seized Letitia's phone. When the police seized Letitia's phone on January 29th, just two days after Gannon was reported missing, her secret was out because the full version of the video was on her phone. Gannon would testify about the burns through this video. Letitia knew it would soon be discovered, so she began creating a narrative around Gannon's burns to cover her behavior and to minimize their severity. About three weeks after Gannon was reported missing, detectives would begin wiretapping Letitia's phone calls. In the very first wiretapped call with Al, she admits that Gannon was burned. Exhibit 35, February 13, 2020. What is it that you told them that they're not looking at? What, I mean, what is the, can you walk me through it? I know I asked you for that timeline. I don't know how long you got, but I just wanted to start with you for Saturday and what I have. Okay. Saturday, okay. You said you would question, you would just listen. Saturday, hold on. Tisha, Tisha, Saturday, like, what do you mean Saturday? Like, right before, I, like, me and me, Mama left? Saturday? After you left. Okay, okay, gotcha, okay. Key one, Albert is not left for Denver. We put DN in there. Um, got the house cleaned up. G helped with stuff. Um, helped me get stuff out of his car. He's and always there for me because that was something that he asked me. Even taking the trash out, things like that. He took the trash out. Um, he stepped on something in the garage. So my car parked. You had those boards that were underneath my car, right? Yeah. You know. All right. So and then cut his foot on those boards. We flipped the boards over because we were freaking out because I was like, oh my God, your daddy said don't get oil or anything from your car and eat all those boards. You know what boards I'm talking about? The one, the, like the two by fours that I have, like that you drive over to park in the garage? Right. Or yeah, yeah. So, I went in and sit down in the back of the car. You know how funny I am about my car? But also, we just bandaged it up, whatever. We did was stick a bandage on it, whatever, whatever. And I Underneath there, there was a rug. That rug that we stepped out on, it was a, a rug that was put on it. I walked on it, and I was like, yeah, we probably should just throw this away and find a new rug to put out here. So, you talk, you talk, what rug are you talking about again? So, I, uh, the one in the garage? Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. When you stepped out, there was a rug. I said, we probably should just throw this away, because we can always just get another piece or another rug, or I'll go to Dollar Tree and get a rug, right? Okay. I we talked to you in the morning, remember I told you, I sent you a few messages, and I was like, hey, we might go on a hike, whatever. Everyone's going to get dressed. So I too was hurting the gods. All right, so Gannon's stomach hurt, and he was, let's see, Gannon's stomach hurt. And most of the night, he had a stomach ache, and he tried to lay down and poop and stuff like that. I said, you know, I was upstairs, get laying and ready for bed. Well, then, the nowhere, I, the alarm is going off. It didn't start with anything other than the alarm. He had laid down. I went in the room. I was sitting there with the dogs. I don't remember exactly where I was going. I was doing some homework. I hear the alarm go off. So I walk in the living room and the alarm comes in. And I it again. It kept going. And it, then it started fire. It was yelling loud. Fire. 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 And I'm just like, fire? And I look around. I don't see any flipping fire anywhere. So as this goes on, I'm like, okay. So it's put in again. It stops. So I grab Lena, run her outside, run her with the dogs, give her the keys to the truck, throw them in the truck, and I run back inside. Run back inside, still don't know anything, and then remember, or not, Gannon. Sorry that for a second I hadn't remembered that, because I was trying to still figure out where the heck I'm going with that. So I run back downstairs and realize that there's soap down there. I couldn't get it. I was coughing and choking and couldn't, like, get through the smoke part. Run back to the garage. You had these little mouthpieces that you can put over your mouth. Yeah, yeah, those protectors okay. were. So I grabbed one of those, put it over my mouth, ran 
back downstairs, and when I ran back downstairs, again, I was still asleep, not knowing this was going on, and there was fun. I took the cover. There was a whole bunch of tons of cover that was inside that little tan thing and gear and hat on or whatever, and I just jumped on them. I don't know if that was the right thing to do. If it was the wrong thing to do, I'm sorry. But I just jumped on it and kept jumping on it, and, like, Gana was right in one of the covers. So Gana did burn his arms. It wasn't bad. So we ran out. I'm sure they got the footage of us. We ran out first because Gana was grabbing his cover, running out behind there because he was cold. Hey, what time was this so we can, I can maybe tell somebody to look at the footage? So I would imagine whenever that alert went off from ADT, it okay. would have been... Within that, within that few minutes. Yeah, like, fine, I got you. When he runs to the car, he runs in because I'm running. He's running right behind me. I'm jumping your truck. All he's jumping your truck is the keys were laying there. Okay. He's jumping your truck. He jumps in on the driver's side. He's screaming, crying, whatever. Lena's in the back seat with the two dogs. We crank your truck, we turn your truck on, and we drive the hell off. That's me why we drove off. I was freaked out because I was like, oh my god, like. It was the carpet, it was the slope was more, more scary and terrifying than actually the fire. So, okay. what we did was we drove around the block, we were talking, he's explaining to me that he thought I was coming and he was grounded from the switch. So, he thought I was coming, and when he thought I was coming, he knocked over the candle. Okay. Because apparently he was playing the switch when he shouldn't have been playing, which is fine. Like, had I not gotten downstairs, when I did, had I not heard it, or the alarm system, or covering knocks out, or whatever, if I could have hit that couch, I don't know that I could have gotten again. Come back inside. Lena's terrified. I said, Lena, go lay in the bed. She's laying in the bedroom. And I was like, he, he doesn't want to go back to his room. I said, okay, will you lay in Lena's bed? He said, yes. He started to say he was cold and had a little bit of shivers. And so I was like, Gannon, I took him and put more clothes on top of him now. Came it on me, whatever. He didn't take his clothes off to go through anything, but I asked him, was he hurting? And was anything else, whatever. And he told me it was just his arms. So I didn't see anything that would have thrown a flag that I had to be like, oh, my God, emergency or anything like that. I didn't see anything like that. But if his arms was bubbling, that's not an emergency? Well, it, it, it hadn't broke skin. Like, it was just, like, underneath. It hadn't skin or whatever. Okay. So, okay. All right. In my mind, I'm like, okay, well, let's evaluate the situation, you know, tomorrow and see. Or he lays down in Lena's bed. Lena sleeps in my bed, our bed. Charlie comes home. I go in and I'm telling, like, I already prepped Charlie for what was going on. I know I'm scared to go to sleep. So we both went in there and checked on again. In, in Lena's bed. We gave him water. We said, well, we're like, you okay. He was more scared of anything. And so I can't, of course, I was like, what? You know, someone said something because I said, so the couch. I wasn't talking about sell the couch to fix the daggone carpet. I was talking about, like, I would get rid of that couch and get a new couch. Don't panic. Like, you know, and I was like, I'll find a new couch. We'll fix the couch. We'll, we'll replace everything in here. Don't worry about it. So, again, it was still, like, you know, upset. He was not only emotional about the situation. So, to get to the next part, Cannon started to kill him. Wait, like when? When would how? When did he start to like, kill it? Yeah, started to kill it because I guess he was either asleep, I don't know, anxious. I don't know. One day he started to kill it. He started to kill it because you know, obviously he starts to kill things. So along with killing that, he started killing his fingernails. So, and I like that morning. I see you should have been and laying in bed on Monday morning. To your thought. Yeah, right, right. And it was laying in the bed, whatever. I went back in there, checked on him, gave him some more water, made him drink some more Pedialyte, because he wasn't eating, because he was so upset. And, he, and that's when I noticed he started killing things, like on his arm. And I said, in the end, at that point time, which I told you, like I told them, she didn't have blood, that was on his arm and on the side of his wall. I guess from sleeping through the night, whatever it was, killing it. Because we towed him back down to his room after Lena decided to go back up in. On the side, you said on the side of his wall. You never told me that. What do you see when you get home? Describe to the jury what you see in the house when you got home from work. My mom and Lena are in the living room, and they're telling me about the fire. Um, Gannon wasn't upstairs at this point. So who you said they are telling you? Were both Lena and your mom telling you about what happened downstairs? Yes. What did your mom tell you at this point when you get home? 
she told me that the candle was knocked over. Um, she thinks that he was playing on his Nintendo when he wasn't supposed to be, so that, that's how he knocked it over. Um, that after the fire, they ran outside, and she called her fireman friend and asked if the fumes in the house were okay for us to go back inside, and they said yes. And she said that when they were in the street, Gannon was screaming that he hates his life and screaming different things. What did you think about that last part your mother just told you about Gannon? I didn't think that the candle thing was a big deal, so it was just still so like, confusing. Was your mother concerned about Albert finding out about this and being upset about it? Normally, Albert's not the one to get mad about like stuff getting messed up, so... When she told you about Gannon going out in the street and yelling that he hates his life and things like that, did that sound like the Gannon that you knew? No, he hasn't done that before. You said that it was Lena and your mom upstairs when you got home on the 26th afterwards. Mm -hmm. Do you know where Gannon was at? Downstairs. Did you go downstairs? Yes. What did you see when you went downstairs? Him laying in his bed. Did you go into his room? Um, by the doorway. Was he asleep? I don't remember. Did you talk to him? No. Was the light on in his room? I don't know. Is that the last time you saw him? Yes. Were there, window were there any windows open in the basement when you went down there? Yes, the windows were open. It was cold down there. How many windows were open down in the basement? I don't know. It was January 26th at... You know about what time it is now when you went down to Gannon's room? It was a little later because my mom was like, let's go tell Gannon goodnight. So that's why we went down there. Anything unusual about your mom saying, let's go tell Gannon goodnight? Not something that she normally would do. And it's not something she would normally do? Correct. That surprising to you when she said that? Yes. Did she go down there with you when you went to Gannon's room? Yes, we both went down there. Do you recall your mom talking to Gannon? She said goodnight to him. She was like, goodnight. Do you know whether or not Gannon responded? I don't remember, no. So, was Gannon's bedroom window open as well? I don't know. Was it cold down in the basement? Yes. Did you sleep down in the basement that night? No. Where was your room within the house? In the basement. Would it have been close to Gannon's room, or was it like on the other side of the basement area? On the other side of the basement. Was your room cold in there? I don't remember. Why'd you sleep upstairs? Because it was cold downstairs. We could still smell, like, the fumes, and, like, everything just felt like, everything in the house just felt weird. Why did it feel weird? Because my mom made the comments. She was like, Gannon's acting weird. I don't know what's wrong with him. She said that she was scared. Who else slept upstairs? Lena. Is there anyone else in the house? No. So it's you, your mom, Lena, and Gannon? Yes. Gannon's the only one sleeping in the basement? Yes. It's cold down there? Yes. Are we talking freezing cold, or was it just colder than the upstairs? Colder than the upstairs. That's why you didn't sleep down there? Yeah. And where did you sleep? In particular, what bed? In my parents' room. Did you sleep with your mom in the same bed? Mm -hmm. Yes, sorry. There you go. Okay, good. Afraid that the detectives were uncovering the clues to her evil deeds, with a calculated mind during that February 13th phone call, Letitia would lay out a detailed timeline with fictitious short stories to accompany it. She made sure to explain her intentions of that video. She had no choice because it was now in the hands of the police. During that candle video, Letitia was doing something she would later be captured doing with her daughter, Harley, as well, steering the comments. She steered Gannon's comments to make it look like he set the fire. Gannon was likely asleep before this incident and had no idea of what had happened. And then when he woke up to Letitia's wrath and accusations of something he did not do, he didn't know what to make of it all. In my opinion, Gannon was confused about what was going on and was worried about his burns more than anything else. Letitia's goal was to intimidate him into accepting the blame. She created fear and anxiety in him by gaslighting him and making it seem as if his actions would get them put out of the home. She made him believe that they needed to sell things to fix the carpet or be put out of the house, a narrative that could only work with a young, innocent mind. That wouldn't have had the same effect on someone Harley's age. In the long version, she cut him off by talking over him to stop him from saying anything more, and then places emphasis on the word tomorrow. Shh, listen, 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 listen. So tomorrow, 
The word tomorrow is elongated, almost as if she's singing it. Letitia tends to sing her words at times, especially when she's in character, elaborating a tall tale. Every day at school, we lay out clothes, we do whatever, we just try this black one with this, or there's a blue one with this. But although we just bandage it up, go up there, the new layout, yada, yada, yada. This time of year. So tomorrow, she sings the word tomorrow. Her emphasis on the word telegraphs that this is the big finish of the video, like a cliffhanger at the end of a movie. It tells me that the sudden cliffhanger cutting the video off after tomorrow was intentional and was meant to cause fear in Gannon. Gannon's whimpers in the video give me the feeling he was very groggy. He is almost whining like a sleepy baby. He was injured, yes, but it also sounds like he was experiencing grogginess that medicines like Benadryl can cause. Gannon was poisoned with hydrocodone, according to the medical examiner. I submit that she started this process before the candle incident. This video was a performance by Letitia. It was not accidental as she would have us to believe. She created this short horror film both to clear her name and to terrorize Gannon in the process. She couldn't help herself. She hated him. She hated Landon and she resented Al. Let's not forget her search from the day before. One day they will wish they treated you differently. This was the day. After the big production of the candle spill, Letitia later admitted to detectives that she exaggerated the candle story because she wanted Al to come home. She said it was always hard being there without him. She also told detectives that the kids were in on the exaggeration. We didn't want Howard to like, like come home, like come, not just like come home and meet for that, but we maybe like had a bit a little bit to Albert because we were like, Thinking, you know, like, oh, maybe send like, home, you know, like, whatever, worried, mm-hmm. you know, like, whatever. So, in my message to Albert, probably was a little bit like, um, a little more over exaggeration. Did you say we? Did you talk to the kids about let's get Albert home? No, no, we, we, we did sit down. And because when I was asking him, like, was this, you know, did you do this on accident? Was this accident, you know, whatever. And so we were just talking about, you know, like the whole thing, everybody was in one room, uh, we were all in the bedroom at the time, which was our bedroom upstairs. Okay. So we were all in the bedroom upstairs and it was just, you know, just talking and, you know, whatever. And I thought I got to let your daddy know. And then I was, I was not going to tell him. That was the original thing. I was not telling him. It was just to fix it and not tell him. Mm-hmm. Um, because then I was like, if I just do that, we don't have to, you know, we don't have to worry about it. Right. Uh, but then that was just an opportunity to be like, oh, well, maybe I'm going to be like, oh, just come back home and worry. It was hard. Like, you know, always, all of us just there going through all these memories and doing all these things without him, you know, yeah. being there. Yeah, I get it. So why suddenly does she admit to exaggerating things? It was certainly not out of the goodness of her heart. She was trying to hide her abusive acts by saying that the kids, including Gannon, were exaggerating the story with her. If the story was exaggerated, so too were Gannon's burns. When the candle incident first happened, Letitia said that Gannon was partially asleep when she discovered the candle spill, but later changed her story, saying that Gannon was playing with his Nintendo Switch, heard her coming down the stairs, and in his effort to hide what he was doing, he knocked the candle over. Letitia then doubled down on this story early the next morning by telling Al in a text that Gannon had admitted this to her. She didn't want Al to think she was responsible in any way for the fire, so she placed the blame directly on Gannon. But hanging her hat on the narrative that Gannon started the fire when he heard her coming down the stairs made no logical sense. Here's why. If Gannon knocked over the candle when he heard Letitia coming down the stairs, there would have been no fire prior to Letitia coming down the stairs. In this scenario, it is the act of Letitia going down the stairs that caused the fire. Therefore, her story about the alarm going off, running out of the house with Lena and the dogs, and then going back in the house for Gannon.
cannon would have all occurred before the existence of the fire. And since the fire starts with Letitia in this scenario, it would only have been burning for seconds before her arrival in the basement. The chain of events. She goes down the stairs. Gannon knocks the candle over. She's in the basement in time to put the fire out seconds after it started. Also, if Gannon was awake playing his game and the smoke was thick enough to set off the fire alarm, he would have been first to act. Running up the stairs and out of the house, it would have been unbearable for him to stay down there. By vacillating on her story, Letitia shared a kernel of truth. As she stated in her original story, I believe he was asleep when this all occurred. This fire only makes sense if Gannon was asleep. In my opinion, Letitia set that fire while Gannon was asleep and waited for the smoke to build up just enough for the fire alarm to go off, then reacted by taking Lena and the dogs. Her suggestion that she forgot Gannon was downstairs says it all. She remembered her dogs, but not Gannon. In my opinion, she was planning for Gannon to perish in the fire. And when Gannon didn't perish from the fire, she punished him by accusing him of starting it and by making him sleep in the cold, fumy basement alone that night. In that candle video, Letitia was angry about her foiled plan. She didn't achieve her goal of killing Gannon, but was left with the damaged carpet that she now had to explain. So she put on a performance to accuse Gannon of causing the fire and emotionally terrorized him in the process. Any person with sense can see that that this video reflects negatively on Letitia. She felt comfortable releasing it because it placed the responsibility for the fire squarely on Gannon. Gannon didn't understand what was happening and she didn't allow him to say too much because he might have slipped up and said something that would have revealed the truth. Indeed, he did say too much. He revealed his burns. That's why she didn't post the full length of the video. She was afraid that Gannon would reveal that she set the fire and burned him. Even though Letitia had all that hatred brewing under the surface for Gannon, Landon, and her husband Al, she wore a mask and played the role of the good wife and stepmom. Would you be surprised to know that the stories about everyone running out of the house into the truck after the fire, driving around the neighborhood, and Gannon running into the street yelling, I hate my life, were all lies. None of the neighborhood surveillance cameras show this. And investigators say there was no evidence showing any vehicles leaving the house that night. And Letitia's suggestion that she was also burned was also a lie. When Harley arrived home that night, she saw no visible injuries to her mother. Harley also reported that Letitia did something weird that night, something she had never done before. She suggested that they go say goodnight to Gannon. So they went downstairs to the basement to Gannon's room. Harley says she stood in the doorway while her mother went inside and said goodnight. Harley could see Gannon's head over the covers but didn't see or hear Gannon respond. This little field trip to the basement disguised as a gesture of concern for Gannon was really Letitia showing Harley proof of life. She wanted Harley to see that Gannon was still alive at that time. Harley said it was freezing cold in the basement because the windows were open. It was 28 degrees in Colorado Springs that night. Letitia said Gannon had the shivers, so she put more blankets on him as he laid in Lena's bed. This was a lie. Gannon wasn't in Lena's bed at all. He was in that cold basement where his and Harley's rooms were located. Harley said she didn't sleep in her room because the basement was too cold and the fumes were still strong. So she and Lena slept upstairs in bed with her mother, leaving Gannon in that fumy, freezing basement while Lena's bed was left empty. This is a glaring indication that Letitia mistreated Gannon. Why didn't anyone else notice this? Let's do some quick math. Saturday night, Al leaves. Gannon suddenly suffers two mysterious accidents, leaving him with a bleeding foot and burned arms. Then Letitia suddenly began making comments that Gannon was acting weird, that she was scared because he ran out into the streets yelling, I hate my life. Now add to that the poison found in Gannon's system and Letitia's plan to kill Gannon becomes crystal clear. If we look at her deleted web 
web searches, it becomes clearer. Something a suicidal person might say. She settled on, I hate my life. I don't like my stepson. I think that's clear. She left him in that cold, fumy basement alone when there was a warmer, empty bed upstairs. Mistreating him this way might explain this sentiment, you think? January 27, 2020. My son burned the carpet. How do I fix it? Son's sick and he stayed home. It's nearly 3 a.m. Monday morning. It's now tomorrow, the day everyone will wish they treated Letitia differently. Letitia was scheduled to go to work in just a few hours. She was an assistant teacher for District 20, but she's still awake. Googling her thoughts, some she deleted, but were still captured in her digital footprint. Why did she Google my son burn the carpet instead of burn carpet, how do I fix it? As if Google was going to suggest some form of punishment for Gannon. Letitia sends a text to Al. Gannon is in the bathroom. He's crying about going to school tomorrow. There's no response from Al. Clearly not sleeping well. At 4.36 a.m., she fires off another message. I'm just gonna give them an excuse at work and stay home with him. I don't think he should be here alone. And we haven't heard from you by call since you left Saturday night. Al responds in agreement. Letitia would then inform Gannon's school that he would be absent today. And immediately following this, she would text her boss, the assistant principal at Mountain Ridge Middle School, explaining that she would not be at work today because her stepfather had just passed away. She said someone hit him with a car while he was walking. She went on to say that she would be flying to the East Coast for the services. Now, while part of this story holds some truth, there is one big problem. Letitia's stepfather was indeed hit by a car, but it occurred several years prior. It was sometime around 2004 when this tragic incident really occurred. Letitia's excuse for not going to work was egregiously deceptive, but behind her heartless statement lay a deeper intention, an eerie foreshadowing of a plan known only to her that someone in her family would indeed die today. Shortly before 5 a.m., Letitia gets out of bed, undetected by Harley and Lena. She goes down to the basement and then tells Al she was checking in on Gannon, and that at that time, he admitted to her that he knocked the candle over when he heard her coming down the stairs. Unbeknownst to Letitia, choosing this narrative was a big mistake. It simply made no logical sense. With this sequence of events, the fire would exist only after Gannon hears her coming down the stairs to the basement. Basement. And because of this, Letitia and Gannon would be together at the start of the fire. She and Gannon would have been first to evacuate, not Lena and the dogs, as Letitia alleged. Harley didn't realize her mom had gone from the bed until 7.20 a.m. when she awoke. Where are you? Harley texted, but there was no response from Letitia. What were you doing down there, Letitia? Are you feeding Gannon more poison? My sleuthy senses say she fed him more poison earlier this morning because around 8 a.m. after Harley had gone to work and Lena to school, Letitia again documents proof of life. At 8.15, she takes a picture of Gannon lying in his bed asleep and sends it to Al. And then she snaps another picture, this time from a slightly different angle at 8.15. 18 a.m. and sends this to Al too. Remember the night before, Letitia made sure Harley and Lena got a look at Gannon before going to bed. And now she's making sure to send time-stamped images of Gannon to Al while he's asleep in his bed. It's another proof of life documentation that Gannon was still alive. You could see Gannon's prized possession, his Nintendo Switch game captured in both pictures. And then minutes after Letitia sent those pictures of Gannon asleep, she sends a message posing as Gannon to Al from Gannon's phone about hanging out with a fictitious friend who has an older brother with a car who says they can hang out together after school if Gannon brings bath salts. Letitia was hinting 
that Gannon was hanging out with bad actors and was likely interested in drugs. Bath salts have been known to mimic the effects of illicit drugs and at one point was a craze among young people. Letitia was trying to cover her tracks while at the same time she was creating a narrative that Gannon was not himself. She deleted many incriminating web searches from her phone hoping that they would not be discovered if she was ever caught. What do you do if you suspect a person swallowed poison? She knows he swallowed poison because she gave it to him. We know it too because the medical examiner told us at trial. She fed him poison and then waited around for it to do him in, but that didn't happen. Gannon was a fighter. This web search shows consciousness of guilt. Consciousness of guilt is a legal term that refers to evidence or testimony that reveals that someone knew they were guilty. Letitia's web search shows she was guilty of poisoning Gannon. Her phones and searches were in the hands of the police well before Gannon's body was found. Only the killer would know that Gannon swallowed poison prior to his body being found. About an hour later, Letitia texts Al saying that she left her phone at home and that if he needed her to call her on Gannon's phone. This was another devious thing she did. Letitia was at home texting Al from the very phone she claimed she left behind as if it had already happened. She and Gannon didn't leave the house for another 20 minutes. Now, is this the behavior of someone who is insane or someone who is calculating? A neighbor's surveillance camera shows Letitia and Gannon leaving home at 10:12 a.m. Many have commented about how sluggishly and slowly Gannon walks to the truck. It appears he drops something, likely his Nintendo Switch. Letitia picks it up and they get into the truck and leave for Petco, a 30-minute drive away. Letitia is seen on surveillance at Petco, making a purchase at 11.22 a.m. The store clerk said Letitia was acting strange. She was often seen looking from the front window of the store out to the parking lot. Gannon was in the truck. He didn't go inside the store with her. Letitia leaves Petco and then returns and she's seen making a second purchase at 1.22 p.m. Detectives say that Letitia's whereabouts were unknown for about an hour or so between her first and second Petco purchases. Al texted Gannon earlier, hey buddy. but Gannon's phone is suspected to be in Letitia's possession at this time. And she replies as Gannon, can I play Zelda at least? Al responds, not today. About 20 minutes after her second purchase at Petco, a search was performed on Gannon's phone. Can my parent find my cell phone if it's off? It was an immediate giveaway that Letitia had conducted this search. In the same way that your handwriting is unique to you, the way you type things into your phone can reflect a unique signature-like pattern. In Letitia's case, she would often insert a period for a space. Why is this important? When Gannon disappeared, his phone did not. It stayed in Letitia's possession, likely because Letitia was afraid it could still be tracked even if the phone was off. When I did the search, the answer was yes, it may still be trackable. I believe Letitia had to change her original plan due to this. Letitia and Gannon returned home at 2.19 p.m. They lingered in the truck 39 seconds before getting out. Prosecutors said that they could see a shadow of Gannon getting out of the truck on the passenger side, but it was not highly visible in any videos released to the public. After watching the surveillance video, many have speculated that Gannon did not return. So Letitia and Gannon return home at 2.19 p.m. They linger in the truck for 39 seconds and then go into the home. Letitia enters the alarm code and they go inside the house at 2.22 p.m. As it turns out, Letitia's phone was indeed left at home. She had some missed calls and unanswered text messages while they were out. Her phone had been locked since 9.56 a.m. and was being serviced by the tower near the home since then as well. This was highly suspicious because Letitia was an extensive phone user and rarely ever left without her phone. 
At 2.29, the Tisha's Tiguan truck that is normally parked front end in first has been backed into the garage and she's seen milling around in the garage from a different neighbor's ring camera. You can see her looking out of the garage. Letitia's phone stayed locked even after returning home. Al texted Letitia. You there? But she didn't answer. ADT registered significant activity both in the basement and upstairs, and someone seems to go in and out of the back door a lot as well. According to investigators, it's during this time that Letitia murdered Gannon in his basement bedroom, stabbing him 18 times in the chest, head, and neck. He fought back as some of the wounds were defensive. She hit him with a blunt object four times, cracking his head like an eggshell, and then shot him in his jaw, fracturing his vertebrae, and ultimately internally decapitating him. Two of the projectiles were lodged in the pillow. In a state of panic, Letitia again tries to hide incriminating searches. Blood is spurting from an arterial bleed. Direct pressure not controlling. What do I do? How to get blood out of sheet. Letitia knew Gannon had experienced excessive bleeding and tried to explain it away by saying it was hers and Gannon's mixed. DNA test would later reveal it was primarily Gannon's blood found in his room. Letitia was up against the clock. As soon, Lena would be returning home from school. She feverishly cleans up, picks up the shell casings, the knife, and the gun. Letitia would then stuff Gannon's body into a suitcase with his Nintendo Switch and the sheets from his bed. When she was done, she would store the suitcase containing his body in the storage room, throwing boxes over to hide it. At 3.15, Lena arrived home from school, but Letitia would make her stay outside and ride her bike. When Lena asked where Gannon was, Letitia said he was asleep in her bed and that she could not see him. 20 minutes later, Al texted Gannon. Hey, buddy. But there was no answer. It was too late. Letitia had exacted her revenge. Gannon was deceased by this time. Moments later, Harley would text Letitia to tell her she was on her way home, something she always did. And when she got there, Letitia immediately sent Harley out for cleaning supplies, telling her to take Lena with her. Lena had stayed outside until Harley arrived from work. While Harley was out, Letitia texted, Carpet powders, two things. Baking soda, trash bags. When Harley and Lena returned at 5.33 p.m., Gannon was nowhere in sight. Al texted again at 5.34 p.m. How'd the kids FaceTime? But Letitia didn't respond for an hour, and when she finally did reply at 6.27 p.m., she said something was wrong and that she couldn't find Gannon. She said she told him to return from his friend's house by 6 p.m. and that he didn't. Then around 6.55 p.m. that evening, Letitia would call the El Paso Sheriff's Office to report Gannon missing. The deputies arrived at the home later that evening, and Letitia told them that Gannon had left earlier in the afternoon around 3 or 4 to walk to a friend's house. He did not come home at the time she had set for him to come home, so she called to report him missing. When asked, Letitia gave the deputies permission to search the house, and they would find nothing out of place. Then a massive search effort was launched. The community came together in droves to help support an extensive search, which involved multiple law enforcement agencies and community volunteers, search and rescue teams, canine units, drones, and the Colorado National Guard was also called in to assist the search effort. Flyers with Gannon's picture were distributed throughout the community, and a Facebook group called Find Gannon was created to help coordinate the search. The search lasted for several weeks and covered a large area around the home. January 28, 2020, one day following Gannon's disappearance. It had been several agonizing hours since Gannon was reported missing, and the situation grew increasingly dire. To compound the urgency, weather temperatures dipped to 24 degrees overnight. 
every passing moment only heightened the concerns for Gannon's safety and well-being. Al had arranged to catch a flight back to Colorado. And very early this Tuesday morning, Letitia would tell Al that Gannon Googled, Can my parents find my cell phone if it is off? But we know who really ran this search. Instead of pretending to focus on search efforts, Letitia's paranoia would start to get the best of her. She was overcome with the idea that she was being left out and would soon start vying for Al's personal attention, wanting to know why he wasn't responding or wanting to talk to her. In these critical moments of Gannon's disappearance and the impending drop in temperatures, Letitia's narcissism would reveal itself in plain sight. As the situation grew increasingly urgent and the community rallied in a desperate search for the missing child, Letitia's self-centeredness would become impossible to ignore. As the only person fully aware that Gannon's body was hidden in a corner of the basement, Letitia likely couldn't sleep. So she began searching for what law enforcement would do next. What is the process for our runaway child? Police steps for our runaway. Police steps for our missing child. It's 6.19 a.m. and a bit dark outside. It's the perfect time to move the body from the basement without being noticed. So Letitia decided she would take a quick drive around the neighborhood to see if anyone's watching. Letitia could be seen on surveillance cameras driving her Tiguan out of the garage. And then 10 minutes later, she returns home and backs into the driveway. The garage door opens. Then there is movement inside the garage. A surveillance video shows someone come from inside the home and back to the Tiguan. Then the Tiguan is backed into the garage. Detectives would later learn that Letitia moved Gannon's body from the utility room in the basement, up the stairs, and out through the garage door, leaving a trail of DNA evidence behind her. Blood had stained the wood lying on the floor in the garage and the bumper of the Tiguan where she loaded Gannon's body in the back. While driving with Gannon's body in the back of her truck, Letitia makes an outgoing call. This time, it's to Landon from Gannon's phone. Letitia would repeatedly make calls to Landon from Gannon's phone in the wake of him going missing. She would make sure to use her personal phone when calling Al, Harley, and the police. But when it came to Landon, she would repeatedly choose to call her from Gannon's phone. It was as if Letitia couldn't resist the sinister pleasure she would get from watching Landon's emotional turmoil unravel before her eyes. Feeling that the coast was clear to move Gannon's body, Letitia drove to the airport, rented a car, and then left her truck with Gannon's body in it in the short-term parking lot. She had previously arranged to meet Al at the airport when he landed. When she met Al at 9 a.m. in the airport, her excuse for the rental was that she wanted to save on her truck's leasing miles. Al, thinking nothing of it, goes along. Shortly before connecting with Al, Letitia had texted Harley, who was still at home, telling her to pull her car into the garage. And Harley would unknowingly conceal the blood-stained wood in the garage with her car. Then Al and Letitia would arrive home shortly thereafter. When Al asked Letitia where her Tiguan was, he was met with evasion. But Letitia at some point later told him she parked it at her old school, French elementary school, and that a coworker had driven her to the airport. Throughout the morning, reporters and detectives were making their rounds. Al takes his truck out to search for Gannon. Everyone who could help with the search did. That is everyone except Letitia. Harley even group texted her friends, asking for help while Letitia was busy kicking up conspiracies about the bath salts and theories of being excluded from the investigative details. At 12.57 p.m., Letitia Googled, Can my Nintendo find my Switch? She was worried because Gannon's switch was packed into the suitcase with his body, and at this time, he was in the short-term parking lot at the airport. Letitia and Al would soon meet with Detective Bethel at Starbucks for their first field interview to discuss the timeline, Gannon's friends, clothing he was last seen in, and his state of mind before going missing. During this interview, they were asked to provide a toothbrush for a sample of Gannon's DNA. After the interview, Al would go back out to search for Gannon and Letitia disappeared. 
and she would put her phone in airplane mode so as not to be detected while driving around because she at the time was taking a quick trip through the airport parking lot for a status check on the Tiguan and Gannon. That afternoon, about 4.40 p.m., Al went for an interview at the sheriff's office. He would bring with him Gannon's toothbrush and asked Letitia to meet him there, but she was nowhere to be found. At this time, Letitia was doing everything she could to delay and evade the interview, stirring up conspiracies that she was not being included and now being framed. Meanwhile, detectives were at the house wanting to get information, but Letitia told Harley not to talk to anyone. After concluding his interview with the sheriff, Al's mind was consumed by a frenzy of doubts and suspicions. Determined to find answers, he set out once again on his search, his heart heavy with anticipation and fear. French elementary school beckoned to him. As Al drove around the area surrounding the school, his eyes scanned the surroundings, desperately seeking any sign of the Tiguan. But there was no trace of the Tiguan anywhere. In that moment, a chilling realization crept over Al. He realized something wasn't right. Al's mind raced, dissecting past conversations and actions with newfound scrutiny. Could there have been subtle signs he missed? He now feared that the person he had trusted implicitly, his wife, might not be telling him the truth. The weight of the suspicion settled heavily upon his shoulders. The absence of the Tiguan was the turning point he had been dreading. It shattered the fragile hope he clung to and replaced it with a bleak belief. Letitia's words, her carefully crafted facade of innocence, crumbled like a house of cards. Overwhelmed by the weight of his discovery, tears streamed down Al's face as he dialed the number for the sheriff's office. The detectives on the other end of the line told him to come back immediately. Al gathered himself and drove back to the sheriff's office for a second meeting. In the meeting with the sheriff, Al laid bare his concerns, recounting his visit to French elementary school and the absence of the Tiguan. He emphasized that this detail, once seemingly innocuous, had now become a pivotal piece of the puzzle. It shattered the fragile trust he had placed in Letitia and cast a dark cloud of suspicion over her involvement in Gannon's disappearance. Later that evening, Landon would touch down in Colorado Springs. Letitia was supposed to pick her up, but she never showed up. It's now about 7 p.m. and Letitia returns to the airport parking lot where her truck and Gannon's body were stashed. This time, Letitia would switch the rental for her Tiguan. Detectives later found all the parking receipts that detail when Letitia entered the lot and left the Tiguan. They would also find parking receipts for when she drove through for the status check. The ticket says Letitia drove the Tiguan out of the parking lot at 7.02 p.m. After leaving the airport, Letitia's mind buzzed with a chilling determination as she drove towards the infamous S-curve, a desolate stretch of highway shrouded in dense woods. Carefully, she sought the perfect temporary hiding spot for the suitcase containing Gannett's body. Her phone was swiftly switched to airplane mode, a calculated move to avoid leaving any digital footprints. However, data later recovered from her Tiguan would confirm her location. Hours later, after 10 p.m., Letitia would suddenly appear back online using Wi-Fi near Harley's workplace. She asks Harley to meet her there, but when Harley arrived, Letitia was not there. January 29th, 2020 two days since Gannon's disappearance. Harley waits well over an hour into the early morning of January 29th for Letitia to arrive. And when she finally does, Letitia will get into Harley's car, leaving her Tiguan in the parking lot of the Holiday Inn Hotel that's adjacent to Harley's job. Letitia and Harley would return to the Lorson Ranch neighborhood at almost 2 a.m. While Harley was waiting for her mother, Letitia was texting Detective Bethel, accusing her of ruining her life. Letitia would also arrange an interview with Detective Bethel for later this morning. Letitia agreed to meet Detective Bethel at 10 a.m. 
Then she reached out to Al, saying that she wanted to come home, but she was uncomfortable that Landon and other family members were there. By this time, Al's approach with Letitia had completely changed. He would no longer appease her. He instead demanded the truth. Al would even threaten to call the detectives if she didn't tell the truth. After many text messages, Letitia and Harley arranged to stay in the house, Letitia in the master bedroom, Al on the couch, and Harley in her room. It was well after 2 a.m. and Letitia began firing off a series of text messages to Detective Bethel, trying to explain blood being found in places. She was very concerned about the detective's request for a DNA sample. Letitia claimed that the candle was broken and that she and Gannon both had blood. This was the first time Letitia introduced blood into the storyline. This was the first time she mentioned Gannon possibly being hurt. She said, I didn't hurt Gannon. She had also alluded to potentially being hurt herself for talking, that she had been hiding information, and she alluded to having been carnally violated. As new evidence began to surface, Letitia found herself growing increasingly desperate. Al, along with the diligent efforts of the detectives, were uncovering pieces of the puzzle that threatened to expose her involvement in the unfolding events. Faced with mounting pressure, Letitia felt compelled to concoct new tales and fabricate explanations in an attempt to divert suspicion and halt further investigation. She searched. I want immunity because it was gang-related at 2.34 a.m. that morning, and then looked up articles about immunity. After all the research and preparation for her upcoming meeting with Detective Bethel, Letitia wanted to talk. So Landon and Al met her in their bedroom. Minutes later, Al bursts out of the room, grabs all of the weapons, locks them in his truck, tells the family who had been staying in Gannon's room to vacate it because it may be a crime scene. And then Al calls the sheriff to report that Letitia had been carnally violated and Gannon abducted. This was the first of many stories Letitia told about the day Gannon was murdered. When the sheriff arrived, Letitia would be found in the basement probably double-checking her cleaning. Shortly after talking to the sheriff, at about 10 a.m., Letitia and Harley would leave in Harley's Jetta. Harley had to go to work, but the two would make a stop at the airport to return the keys to the rental that Letitia had abandoned in the airport's short-term parking lot. Letitia saw an Avis worker on the sidewalk, and she tossed the keys to him. She never properly returned the rental, she left the car parked in the short-term parking lot where she switched it for the Tiguan. Letitia was late for her meeting with Detective Bethel. She was supposed to meet her at this time, but Letitia wouldn't show up for her meeting until noon, with her truck dripping wet from a fresh car wash she gave it just before her arrival. During that meeting, Letitia would allege that she was carnally violated and Gannon abducted. She would also strangely request that she be able to reference her notes to answer questions. Because Letitia was claiming an assault of the sexual kind, the detective arranged for her to be examined at the hospital. The suggestion that she go to the hospital stressed Letitia. She would begin to complain of chest pains near the end of the interview, and first responders would arrive to transport her to the hospital for an examination. Letitia's Tiguan and phone were seized at the close of the interview, and Letitia would slip out of the hospital undetected before any examination could be performed. That night, Letitia and Harley would sleep at Janine's place. Janine was Harley's co-worker and friend, but before going to Janine's apartment, the three would drive back to the location where Letitia was parked at the sheriff's office to look for her Tiguan. Prosecutors would later allude to the ladies seeing the deputies around the truck when they drove by. January 30th, 2020, three days since Gannon's disappearance. Until this point, Gannon was listed as a runaway However, after Letitia's interview and the seizure of her car and phone, the case would be upgraded to endangered missing child. 
In the early afternoon, Letitia and Harley would go to Marshall's to get some extra clothes when they were met by the police. The police officers would at that time seize Harley's Jetta and phone, leaving them stranded there. Letitia made a scene during the seizure, running, throwing the car keys, and screaming to Harley, don't say anything. Harley and Letitia were both handcuffed, but the officers would remove the handcuffs and let them go once the seizure was complete. Letitia and Harley had been eagerly awaiting the arrival of their family members in Colorado Springs. They were supposed to meet them at the airport that day, as their loved ones had decided to fly in to provide support and assist with the ongoing search efforts. However, as fate would have it, the seizure had left Harley and Letitia stranded, unable to make it to the airport. Upon hearing about their predicament, their family members promptly came up with an alternative plan. They instead met them at the Marshalls, and Letitia and Harley would stay with them at their hotel. January 31st, 2020, four days since Gannon's disappearance. Letitia's Aunt Brenda took the initiative to make the moving process easier for Letitia and Harley. She had rented a Nissan Altima and later arranged for a cargo van, allowing them to pack and load their belongings from the family home. Accompanied by Letitia's brother Dakota, Letitia and Harley headed to the house to gather their personal items. However, the experience was far from comfortable. Dakota described the atmosphere as highly uncomfortable due to the presence of detectives closely monitoring everything they took. They were not allowed to take any technology. Among the items taken was a red and pink suitcase with blankets, which were later recovered when Letitia was arrested. These items were later found to have Gannon's blood on them. After packing up and leaving the house, Letitia saw reporters from KKTV and decided she wanted to do an interview. The family didn't think this was a good idea, but Letitia insisted. You can even see the white van in the interview. The KKTV interview was weird, to say the least. Letitia's face was turned away from the camera, and she was caught a few times during the interview using past tense when referring to Gannon. When she was asked, what do you want to say to Gannon, she answered, but then realized how she sounded and asked for a do-over. Any message for Gannon? The message for Gannon I have is, Gannon, when you get here, you'll be able to truly tell what happened. And then I really hope I get a sincere apology from everyone who has made all those things, especially from my husband. Take two. I just wanted to add a message to Gannon from my family, is that we love you and miss you, and we hope that you come home soon. And Gannon, I can't wait till you can come home and let everyone know that you're okay. We love you. Harley was in the car, but was summoned by her mother to answer some questions. Here is another example of Letitia steering the comments, but this time with Harley. You can't answer this, but is there anything we can hear about the hike? Was there a hike? We don't, that just seems like rumors right now. You know what? Um, could we bring uh, my daughter up here? Because she can, she can go and say that, you know, she came home from work after the hike and she can verify that Gannon was at our home. Okay, yeah, that's fine with me. If she doesn't want to, that's okay, but you're allowed that's to fine. ask her. Is that an okay so far? Yes, I need Harley. I need Harley. Cause they want you to verify was Gannon at home after the hike. Cause you didn't go to the hike, but you came home from work. Hmm? Do you want me to just say yes? No, just answer the question. Yes, you, you came home from work and you, ver you can verify Gannon was at home. Yeah. I told her she didn't have to be too in depth because she is still, you know, a child, but I want to make sure that someone knows that there's another person to verify that Gannon. Sure. Does she need to hold this? No, that's as so long as she's close. close. So just stay close. And you actually shift a tiny bit that way, just a half inch that way. Okay. Perfect. Okay. And then uh, can you say and spell your name for me real fast? Harley Hunt, H-A-R-L-E-Y Hunt, H-U-N-T. Perfect. And so just don't look away from her because the mic's on that way. So you don't have to like face down into it, but okay. just don't look away. <laughs> um, I was just asking about the hike. Yes. So I came home later that evening. I was at work and I can verify that he was there that night. So there, there was a hike that you guys went on, but then you guys came home. Yes. Where'd you guys go hiking? Garden of the Gods. Garden of the Gods. Okay. Um, I guess when you and then we ate Burger King afterwards. So, you know. 
There you go. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then it just was, I'm going to go to play at a friend's house. Can we step off of here? I don't want her on the... No worries. Okay. I'm good. Okay. Leticia and her family returned to their hotel, and 10 minutes after parking, sheriffs placed a tracker on the rented Altima. Shortly after that, Leticia would tell her family she needed to get dog food and then left in the Altima. While she was out, Leticia would return to the S-curve, this time in the Altima. She retrieved Gannon's body from the woods, drove back to the hotel, and placed it in the cargo van with her belongings. Dakota was suspicious. He knew something was wrong because it took her hours to return. February 1st, 2020, five days since Gannon's disappearance. Leticia's family was set to depart Colorado later today, but Aunt Brenda was concerned. She didn't feel comfortable paying for the insurance of the van while it was out of her watchful eye. So, Leticia and her brother Dakota would go to Budget Rentals to rent a second cargo van. They positioned the vans back to back and transferred the items from one van to the other. While transferring the items, Dakota sees Leticia struggling with a suitcase. He said it was very heavy and he had a gut feeling that something was terribly wrong. Leticia said she didn't need help moving it into the van. Dakota asked, what was in the bag? Leticia would say it was softball stuff. Dakota knew something was off because it was much too heavy for that. Later that morning, about 10 a.m., Leticia and Harley would gas up at Love's Travel Center in Pueblo, Colorado, and would be on their way south. Leticia, Harley, and the dogs all rode in the front of the van. Unbeknownst to Harley, Gannon's body was in the back of the van. Harley recalled her mother keeping the van very cold with the air conditioner on the entire trip. Although she found it strange that her mother insisted on running the air conditioner despite the chilly 50 degree temperatures, she hesitated to question it. Harley said they never went into the back of the van for anything while traveling and Leticia consistently fed the dogs CBD snacks to keep them under control. The rental van they traveled in was equipped with a built-in GPS, so the police were able to track their movements from Colorado through Amarillo to Decatur, Texas, and then to Pensacola, Florida. Leticia and Harley purchased new phones on the trip and were seen on camera renting at Candlewood Suites Hotel at each rest stop. February 4th, 2020. Eight days since Gannon's disappearance. In the eerie stillness of the early morning hours, a series of events unfolded that would forever alter the lives of everyone involved. While Harley lay peacefully asleep, oblivious to the sinister actions taking place, Leticia would depart on a chilling journey. Between the hours of midnight and 4.15 a.m., Leticia silently slipped away from the hotel, leaving no trace of her true intentions. With an icy heart and a suitcase containing Gannon's lifeless body, she made her way to a desolate bridge. Located less than two miles away, the darkness provided an ominous backdrop as Leticia stood on the edge, casting the weight of her unspeakable secret into the depths below. She tossed the suitcase containing Gannon's body over the bridge into a marshy, body of water below. In that fateful moment, Leticia likely felt a twisted sense of relief, believing that she had disposed of the evidence and would be able to evade detection. Returning to the hotel under the shroud of darkness, Leticia was unaware of the digital footprint she had unwittingly left behind. The van she had used to transport the suitcase pinged in a different location than where it had originally been parked. It was an unintentional trace, an electronic clue that would later raise suspicion and form a part of the puzzle that investigators would meticulously piece together. Later that day, Leticia and Harley would depart Pensacola, heading towards Orlando. 
In Colorado that same day, Roderick Drayden, a Lorson Ranch neighbor, told ABC News that he had decided to look through his footage once the search intensified and saw Gannon and Letitia getting into a red pickup truck Monday morning at 10.13 a.m. My Xfinity camera, okay. it picked it up. It picked up um, the young lady taking him, well, it picked up him getting into the vehicle and her taking him off about 10, 16 that morning. Four hours later? And then she returned about 2, 16 without him. The footage also appeared to show Gannon walking slowly as he approached and got into the truck. When Letitia returned at 2.19 p.m., Gannon was nowhere to be seen. Drayton said he showed the security footage to Al on Sunday, February 2nd, and he just broke down crying and said, she lied, she lied about the time. He didn't go to a friend's house. February 5th, 2020, nine days since Gannon's disappearance. Letitia and Harley returned to Myrtle Beach on February 5th. That same day, Landon and Al would make a gut-wrenching plea together for anyone with information to come forward. I'm Landon Hyatt, Gannon's mom, and I encourage you guys, I know many of you mothers and fathers, I encourage you just to seek, find him. I'm so thankful for all the outpouring help that this case has brought. My son is a very loving kid. He wouldn't want harm on anybody at all. And it's so hard to just think, why is this happening to him? I have no clue, but my kid deserves to come home. My kid has a purpose. My kid has a life. And it's important to me, and it's important to everybody that's standing in this room. Gannon, Bubba, little man, mommy's hero, wherever you're at, mommy and daddy's here. And we're begging and pleading for you to come home. I know that's your biggest wish, is to see mommy and daddy standing here. We're here, Bubba. We're here for you, and I can't wait till you're found, because I have hope that you are going to be found. You are my hero. You are the reason why I have life. He's so special to me. I don't think many people can understand. My child was a one pound, six ounce baby. He had a 10% chance of survival. If he survived, he would be profoundly disabled. None of that is accurate. He's gifted and talented. Do anything for anybody. So I'm begging, I'm pleading. If anybody has any type of lead, put yourself in my situation. Ask yourself, what would you do? February 13th, 2020. 17 days since Gannon's disappearance. The search for Gannon moves into Douglas County, Colorado. That same day at 1.11 p.m., Letitia called Al and told him Gannon was burned in the fire. Now that Gannon's body was no longer in her possession, she likely remembered that the candle video was on her phone. So she began creating narratives about Gannon's burns. This was the beginning of many wiretapped calls Al would have with Letitia. Detectives were coaching him during the calls to ensure they got as much information as possible about Gannon and his possible whereabouts. February 14th, 2020. 18 days since Gannon's disappearance. By this time, Letitia had told Al five different versions of events that occurred in the house before Gannon went missing. All of them were recorded via wiretap. On January 29th, Letitia said that someone had abducted Gannon and that they were still in the house when deputies arrived. She said that she tried to signal to the deputies that someone was still there. She also said that she was carnally violated by the man in the house and that man also abducted Gannon. She knew the man's identity because she saw a piece of paper and his identification card fall out of his pocket that had his name on it. Then it was, a man followed her from Petco. He was laying in the middle of the road in front of her car. When she stopped to avoid running over him, he jumped into her car and made her take him home where he assaulted her. Then she and Gannon were near County Line Road and Gannon was riding a bicycle in the area and fell off, hit his head and was abducted by a man. 
Letitia stated that the blood in the corner of Gannon's room was a combination of hers and Gannon's. She said that she and Gannon were both carnally assaulted. She was tied up and the man was still present while the police were there. February 15th, 2020. 19 days since Gannon's disappearance. If you thought Letitia's malicious repeated calls to Landon from Gannon's phone were evil, you won't believe this. On this day, February 15th, Letitia topped that when she posted onto Facebook a video of Gannon waving and saying goodbye as he then jumps off the side of a dock into a body of water below. Letitia hated Landon and Al so much she couldn't help but to taunt them in any way she could. There is no other explanation for her to do this. But while Letitia was stirring up emotions, this also would be the day that detectives would make a major discovery. They would find a piece of particle board with Gannon's blood on it at the S-curve. Al confirmed that the board came from Gannon's room. Detectives believe that Letitia used this board to transport Gannon's body. They believe that she placed it in the trunk first, then the suitcase containing Gannon's remains on top to prevent bleeding through into the vehicle. When tested, the Tiguan was negative for the presumptive presence of blood inside the trunk area. However, blood was found on the rear hatch. February 18, 2020. 22 days since Gannon's disappearance. On February 18th, Letitia attempted to get a fake polygraph from a site in the UK. The company ultimately refused to send it to her because it involved criminal activity. The questions she attempted were found in the notes app on her phone. It read, in the case involving missing child Gannon Stalk, do you intend on telling the truth? In the case involving your stepson Gannon, did you inflict harm on him in any way? No. Did you accidentally hurt him in a physical way? No. Did you murder your stepson? No. Do you know personally who is involved in your stepson's disappearance? No. While Letitia was attempting to get a fake polygraph, she had also been reaching out to a reporter from Nancy Grace's Crime Online, trying to convince her that she was innocent and hoping that she would help her get the message out. February 21st, 2020, 25 days since Gannon's disappearance. The Douglas County, Colorado search was suspended and Letitia tried to get a stranger named Nicole to corroborate a lie for an alibi. Letitia also tried for a second polygraph. I need a fake criminal polygraph. I need to change my look to hide face transplant near me. Fake polygraph test. February 22nd, 2020. 26 days since Gannon's disappearance. One common indicator of a guilty conscience is the perpetrator's desire to change their name or alter their personal appearance in an attempt to escape the consequences of their actions. As the weight of her evil deeds pressed upon her, Letitia's fear grew and she started exploring ways to evade justice. Change my facial appearance. Drastic ways to change your appearance. See what my face will be with plastic surgery. Plastic surgery, Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. February 23rd, 2020. 27 days since Cannon's disappearance. Today, Letitia is consumed by anxiety and the need to know the status of the case. She started on a secret quest for information that extended beyond what was reported in the news. Gannon had not yet been found. Only the killer would know that he had been shot. Gannon Stalk found. Replacement passport. Shock from watching someone get shot. February 24, 2020. 28 days since Gannon's disappearance. On today, Letitia was concerned about the progress of the case. How long does it take to get DNA from crime? 
How long does it take police to get DNA results in Colorado Springs? February 25th, 2020. 29 days since Gannon's disappearance. Today, Leticia found herself consumed by the pressing need to construct an airtight alibi and devise a means of escape. Make a security video past tense. Need a new social security number to hide. Apply for a social if I live on an Indian reservation. February 26, 2020. 30 days since Gannon's disappearance. Today, Leticia's guilty conscience became even more apparent. Despite the passing days, Gannon remained missing. But in the depths of her knowledge, she carried the dark secret of the bridge, the place where she had disposed of Gannon's body. And now a new worry began to gnaw at her consciousness, the maintenance of the bridge. Maintenance under ditches, under bridges. Can I get a plea with no jail time? Criminally negligent homicide in Colorado. Can I find a rich guy? Colorado Springs closed murder cases. Drug cartels in Colorado Springs. What do they do when they find a person's body in another state? How do they identify bodies found in another state? February 27, 2020. 31 days since Gannon's disappearance. As Leticia delved deeper into her search for updates on the case, a subtle shift occurred within her. The weight of guilt and the mounting evidence against her began to chip away at her resolve, causing her to confront the reality that she might face the consequences of her actions. In this newfound acceptance, Leticia started to develop a strategy, a plan to secure a plea deal that could potentially lessen the severity of her punishment. As part of her evolving strategy, Leticia decided to adopt an alternate persona, crystallizing her intentions to plead insane. How do police tell whose body has been found? Can God help me escape jail time? How do they identify whose blood is at the scene? Spanish girl names. Petco, Nevada, Colorado Springs. During the trial, Leticia introduced us to her alter ego, Maria Sanchez. February 28th, 2020, 32 days since Gannon's disappearance. Leticia's guilty conscience continued to torment her, driving her to seek out details that only the perpetrator would possess. Consumed by a desire to stay one step ahead and maintain control over the narrative, today she searched for information that remained concealed from the public eye. Two crucial pieces of knowledge that weighed heavily on Leticia's mind was the fact that Gannon had been deceased for a month and that he had been hidden in a bag. She alone held this chilling secret, a truth that bound her to the crime that she committed. How long does a body start to decompose in a bag? What does a dead body look like after a month? What does a dead body look like after a month? February 29th, 2020, 33 days since Gannon's disappearance. In her ongoing search for answers and perhaps seeking some form of reassurance, Leticia searched the infamous case of Casey Anthony, a mother accused of killing her daughter. The parallels between Anthony's case and her own situation intrigued Leticia. Of particular interest was likely the ultimate outcome of Anthony's case, a verdict of not guilty. Casey Anthony, Casey Anthony and Patrick McKenna. March 2nd, 2020, 35 days since Gannon's disappearance. Today, Leticia Stouk's tumultuous legal journey took a significant turn when she was apprehended in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. The arrest came after a five-week-long search for Gannon Stouk, which shifted the focus from a missing person's case to a full 
full-fledged murder prosecution, although Gannon's body had not yet been found. Initially, Letitia pleaded not guilty, maintaining her innocence in the face of the charges leveled against her. However, as the legal proceedings progressed, a notable shift occurred. Letitia made the unconventional decision to represent herself, assuming control of her defense strategy and opting to navigate the courtroom without legal representation. But Letitia's plea status took yet another unexpected turn. This time, with new counsel by her side, she opted for a plea of guilty by reason of insanity, a defense strategy that sought to challenge her mental state at the time of the alleged crime. March 4, 2020, 37 days since Gannon's disappearance. During her extradition from South Carolina to Colorado, Letitia would make national headlines after she attacked a deputy while being extradited back to Colorado. March 17, 2020, 51 days since Gannon's disappearance. Today, a heartbreaking discovery unfolded in Florida as the search for Gannon reached a devastating conclusion. Bridge inspectors from the Florida Department of Transportation while conducting a routine maintenance, stumbled upon a suitcase hidden beneath the bridge. Upon opening it, they made a grim and horrifying discovery, a young boy's body wrapped in blankets. The unimaginable find sent shockwaves through the community and reignited the deep sorrow and grief that had surrounded Gannon's disappearance, the bridge, once a mere structure connecting two points now became a haunting site where a precious life had been concealed. News of Gannon's discovery reverberated across the nation, eliciting a collective outpouring of sorrow and outrage. The revelation brought a sense of closure to the agonizing search, but it also deepened the wounds that Gannon's loved ones had been forced to endure. The discovery of his lifeless body served as a painful reminder of the immense loss suffered by his family, friends, and the community at large. In a devastating update from the Santa Rosa County Sheriff's Office in Florida, the harrowing details of Gannon Stauk's final moments were revealed. The authorities disclosed that Gannon, the young boy whose disappearance had captivated the nation, had suffered unimaginable acts of violence. According to the official report, Gannon had endured a series of brutal injuries. The sheriff's office disclosed that he had been shot in the jaw, stabbed in the chest and back, and had sustained a skull fracture. The severity and extent of these injuries painted a horrifying picture of violence inflicted upon him. May 8, 2023, the verdict. After three long years, a web of lies and a lengthy trial, Letitia Stauk was convicted of murdering her stepson, Gannon Stauk, whose body she hid in a suitcase, transported over 1,400 miles in the back of a cargo van, and ultimately tossed over the side of a bridge in Pensacola, Florida. The evidence leading to Letitia's conviction was overwhelming, including physical evidence, GPS records, cell phone tower pings, photos, surveillance videos, social media posts, app location services, DNA, wiretaps, and more. The depth of information in this case is said to be the largest in the history of the El Paso County Sheriff's Office, with nearly 800 exhibits entered into evidence in the court. In the courtroom, tension filled the air as Letitia's own daughter and brother took to the witness stand and testified against her. <coughs> Why, Letitia? <laughs> but of all the evidence collected, it was Letitia's text messages and Google search history that were key in her undoing. They would be star witnesses that helped to secure her conviction. Letitia Stauk was transported to the Denver Women's Correctional Facility on the morning of May 12, 2023, after being moved from El Paso County Jail, where she had been housed for the past three years. There, she will serve out a life sentence without the possibility of parole. 
I miss you, Ganon, and I love you to the moon and back and back again. I know every day you're with me and your sisters. That will never be taken away, the ache that I have for you. To hold you, to hug you, to tell you how much I love you, and to see your smile and your innocence. I remember all the pain your dad and I suffered with having children. It was never easy, and we were always fearful through the process. On September the 29th, 2008, our lives were forever changed. Our first biggest blessing came into the world, weighing only one pound and six ounces. You fought all the odds and developed a personality and a smile that's larger than life. You became my hero that day. You forever changed my heart and my life, and that will never change. That is something that can never be taken away from me. You came into this world fighting. And unfortunately, you left this world fighting. Your Honor, she fought against someone that he loved and trusted. Someone that myself and Albert both trusted and loved. Someone who can never understand what it means to love or trust anyone but herself. For more than three agonizing years, I've often wondered what I may say. Or if I would even be able to. For three years, I have questioned every single possibility and scenario. For three years, I have tried to forgive you, but I can't. I want to. But no parent should have to bury their child. No parent should have to see or hear the horrific things you have done to the whole family. She has taken away the most precious gift in this world. Not just my family, not Alice's family, but your own family. She destroyed dozens of lives, lives of people who never wanted to believe that she could have done this. She knew how special Gannon was, and she knew what me meant to most of me. I in my heart can never understand her hatred and insecurities when it came to me. I did love her. Mother to mother, I trusted her with my children. I tried to survive a complicated life with my third child. And you used, she used every opportunity to write a narrative of my life to, again, to try to take pieces of my life. And she already took some of it. That still wasn't enough. She searched so hard for love when all along she had it. But she took it for granted. I didn't hold anger against you then. I still kept my heart open to her. She had so, you had so much love from Lena and Gannon, from Harley, her own daughter, that you willingly, you willingly subjected to the chance of serving time for her crimes. Such an indicator of her inability to love anyone herself. You had support, appreciation for me, even when we couldn't see eye to eye, because I valued her for helping me with our children when I physically couldn't. Even when I was fighting for my kids, as you wrote a false smear campaign against me and my children, and also Al, for me, I still appreciated that they were loved by you. So I thought. She had everyone fooled. She projected abuse and addiction claims against all of us, not just me, when all along she was the one harming innocent children. Anything to take the light off. Manipulating us breaking my kids and murdering my son. I can't say that she ruined my life because that would be some form of stick victory for her. Because even through this process, it's been a game to her. The people who listened doesn't know her style or her sly jabs. She's even made it Albert and I. They, don't, they do not know the significance of certain things she says or does, but we do. Instead of allowing her to take that power of hurting me further, I wanted to tell you this. Let me tell you what Gannon has done. Even to this day, even after you murdered him and she tried to taint any positive image of him, he has caused families and communities to come together. Children and adults have given their life to Christ. He has called unity in times of trial. He is a hero. She even tried to steal that away. A cape, huh? The one image of Gannon that was created for the world after it went national. TV begging for the return of my son, my hero. How dare her? How truly sick and cruel is she? You stole so much from this world. Gannon's cousins, aunts, uncles, sisters, new siblings, grandparents, and friends are missing a huge portion of their lives without Gannon. Lena is missing her brother. Your Honor, I've never seen a bond between two siblings so close as theirs. And she had to take that. Why? I'm afraid we may never know that answer, will we? I show his baby sister, Nova pictures and videos of Gannon so she will always remember who he is because she stole him from us. 
is not forgotten and never will be. And it's so sad to sit here today and face her, a person even gaining love. One that I know while she was attacking and killing him and fought for his life, he defended himself against her, still loving her. A love she never deserved from him for what she has done. Or she is too much of a coward to even come forward with the truth. She owes it to Gannon. But the lack of remorse and the lack of respect to Gannon through this child, her lack of compassion shows me that we were all wrong. She manipulated all of us and never loved Gannon, Lena, or Harvey. I've sat here for over a month having to listen to her sick lies, even as she tried to destroy who I was and Albert as a father. I've had to sit and listen and watch every reenactment of images no one wants left in their mind. You wanted to leave us with that, knowing it would torture us. But you underestimated me. I am Landon, Gannon's mom, and that will never change. Through my hurt, anger, and pain, I will never be the monster that she is. I can never be filled with the hate that her heart holds. I pray that we will never have to look at her face again. I will continue to hold on to my faith. Vengeance is not mine as I surely wish it could be at times, but it's the Lord's. I have to trust in that. Thank you, Judge Warner. For your compassion, your patience through this trial. I want to thank the jury for their attentiveness and time that they took for joy, justice for my boy, to the detectives, officers, legal team for every single second they've poured out into Gannon's case, and to the community for your countless hours. Tisha, that was her biggest mistake. You underestimated this community and this defensive team, Morrison Ranch. They searched for and fought for Gannon within hours, and they never believed your lies from the moment they started. None of these people ever gave up on him. You never looked. All of these people I will forever hold close to my heart. Always get him strong. My gene meant forever. Justice has been served today. Your Honor, I pray that you just give her the best sentencing, the longest sentencing that you can. This will not bring my son back, but I can sleep soundly for the first time in three years knowing that you can never harm, this defendant can never harm anyone again, knowing Gannon will always be a true hero in a cape. He will always be my son. That will never be taken away. Thank you, Gannon, for being a shining example of love and light. May you rest in peace.